Hi, plant friends. Welcome to episode 103 of Boom and Grow Radio. Hello, sweet plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks and hopefully you've been cooking up some of those delicious herb inspired recipes from last week's episode. Just so you know, Mama Fiella and Billy are also on the Bloom and Grow YouTube channel on, in videos that aired last week, breaking down exactly how to cook the bolognese that she talks about made with rosemary and Billy's walnut pesto. So make sure you go check out the YouTube channel if you're interested in seeing them actually make the recipes they talked about. They're so freaking cute. I can't even stand it. And this week, we have an episode, an accompaniment to today's episode discussing watering practices where I break down how I like to water my plants and my watering routine. If you're interested in checking it out, you can click the link in the show notes to check out the YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe. Also, speaking of clicking links, I would love for you to take my listener survey. The 2020 Bloom and Grow Radio listener survey has been created to source you guys for where you want the future of the show to go. Number one, from a content perspective, I ask you what episode topics you want, what YouTube videos you want. And also, I'm going to probably be building out some really exciting things for Bloom and Grow, and I want your input before I go ahead and do it. So if you're interested to check that out and give me your feedback, I would be so very thankful. You can click the link in the show notes. It takes, I think, four minutes and 30 seconds is the average that it takes everyone. So please take four minutes, do me a solid, and take that survey so I can get to know you better, plant friend. I am so excited about today's episode. We welcome back Chris Satch, otherwise known as Botanic Tonic on Instagram. Chris is a beloved repeat guest of Bloom and Grow Radio. It's been a while since we've had him, and I'm calling it. I feel like this is going to be the most downloaded episode in Bloom and Grow Radio history. It's so freaking good, and it's all about watering. So Chris and I get so many questions about watering. I know within our community, people feel kind of insecure on, am I watering correctly? Am I watering the right amount of time. I feel like you get these care cards and you think that you're supposed to water once a week, but it's really all about empowering yourself to know exactly what to do, to be able to read your plants and be able to find your own personal watering practice. So Chris and I get into a healthy debate on some watering practice techniques. We don't see eye to eye on all of it, but it's really a great conversation and it's just chock full of information. That's enough of an intro, but before we dive into the conversation, I just want to thank our newest Patreon plant friends. We have so many new plant friends rolling in these days. Patreon plant friends are listeners in our community that support Bloom and Grow monetarily on a monthly basis for pretty much the amount of a cup of coffee. So thank you to our newest Patreons, Vivian Farmer, Iva T, Meredith Martineau, Cat Page, Tony Lightgab came in way over the base price to be a plant friend. So thank you for your generosity, Tony. Olga also came in over the $4 base level for being a plant friend, Amy LeFevor and Jessica McElvain. Thank you to our newest plant friends. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Your support means the absolute world to me, and I can't wait to really get to work on building out some upper levels of the Patreon tier. Behind the scenes, that's what's going on with Bloom and Grow in addition to a few other things. So in the next couple of months, hopefully you'll see that rolling out. So thank you, plant friends. Okay, let's get right to this awesome conversation. Today, we are supported by Espoma Organics. Espoma Organics is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. Plant friends, we know I've adored Espoma Organic products for a really long time now. My love affair with them started when I got gifted a bottle of their indoor house plant liquid fertilizer at a Summer Rain Oaks plant swap. I fell in love with the fertilizer and started continually using it. It is so easy. If any of you guys are struggling with what to fertilize with, I can't suggest it enough. It comes in a bottle that has this pre-filled cap mechanism. So all you do is you flip the bottle over, the cap fills up to this pre-dosed amount of liquid, and then you just dump the liquid into your watering can. Like it's literally that simple. And because it's specifically for indoor plants, you don't have to mess with like 
halving or quartering the dosage for your outdoor plants to then make it for your indoor plants. Like it's pre-measured. It makes fertilizing houseplants so easy. They also have plenty of fertilizers for your outdoor plants as well, but definitely try that out. I also love their potting mixes. They've got a general potting mix and a succulent mix that I use for all my houseplants. And when I want to like get real mad science-y, I'll even mix in their perlite or their orchid mix with my general potting mix to just make it my own if I'm feeling like I want like a fun little project for the day. And if you do have lawns or outdoor gardens, they have so many amazing products that I don't talk as much about because I'm more houseplant focused, but they've got their Biotone Starter, their Holly Tone, their Bulb Tone, a whole line of tones that are specifically catering to different types of outdoor plants that will fertilize and nourish your outdoor plants and keep them happy and growing. So from potting mixes to fertilizers to pest control, Espoma has the eco-friendly organic products to help you and your garden thrive. To learn more about all the things that they offer for indoor and outdoor plant people, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to the Espoma Amazon storefront to order online. Thanks again, Espoma Organics. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio, Chris. Hey, glad to be back. I'm so excited. I don't even know what number episode this is for you. We've had too many really fun, nerdy conversations. (laughs) That's the thing. When you have a lot of fun, you're just so involved in the fun, you just don't even remember. And that's great. I love it. So you have always been, I mean, you were on episode, I think you were episode two, if not three of Blue and Grow Radio. And you have always been one of my go-to botanists, horticulturalists that I go to, to break down all of these kind of like sciencey planty questions. You have like a thread in our texts of like photos of my plants that I text (laughs) you asking for help about. So how's your collection going since the last time we talked? Like, what are you loving these days? So really these days, I mean, everybody knows me as the plant doctor. I botanic tonic. I focus on orchids, but I really love all plants. And honestly, lately, a lot of my orchids that haven't bloomed in a long, long time have bloomed for me after I moved (gasps) to my new apartment. So like, they're like all exploding with growth and they're super great, but One plant that really impressed me that I was like totally shocked that it like did so well is my Boston fern. Like regular Boston fern, they're shedders. So like they'll drop a leaf here and there, but like it just like exploded with growth. It just loves this new apartment. And I love that it loves the apartment. And like anyone who knows me knows that like besides orchids, like I have a big soft spot for ferns, fern allies, mosses, lichens, like the really primitive plant life because they're just so cool and mm-hmm. so interesting. I just love the way that their structures, their colors, they're so colorful too. The way they interact with the environment, the way that other plants depend on them, everything like that. So I actually, believe it or not, I took some spores because it started sporulating and I wanted to propagate it. So instead of waiting for it to grow a division, I decided, okay, let me take some spores. Let me take my thumb, thumb off some spores and mush them into some perpetually wet sphagnum soil in my vivarium over there. So I did that. And just a couple of days ago, I think I posted on my stories, I saw the little tiny fern baby starting to grow, the little gametophytes. They have these, and they're so cool too. They have like two parts of their life cycle. They have this like weird, like heart shaped, like green growth thingy. It's called a gametophyte. And they started like plopping on the top of the soil and they're like all cute and super green and like ultra neon green. And I could start to see the sporophyte or the fronds start to form off of them. And it's just like so cool. I have to send you some pictures. Yeah. Send me some pictures and I'll put them in the show notes for this episode. And this is such a cool story to hear because we just published episode 99 was how to care for ferns. And Lisa from Houseplant Guru talked about the process of propagating spores. So how funny that you are like actually going through that right now. Oh my God. I can't wait to see those photos. I bet those baby ferns are so cool. It's interesting what you were saying about like lichens and stuff like that, because a lot of those ferns, the kind of plants that you like, I mean, they feel prehistoric. It feels like you have a little dinosaur in your apartment. They really are. Ferns, lichens, mosses, all of them have existed before the dinosaurs. Like if you take Earth's history and break it down, there were things called tree ferns. 
that dominated the landscape in the Carboniferous period, like well before dinosaurs, and is actually where we get most of our natural gas and oil from. It's not dead dinosaur, it's actually dead plant. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you have these, and they used to dominate the landscape, and we have them in fossils, and we have a few living specimens. Most of them are extinct, but we have a few living ones at the botanical gardens, and some vendors in Florida sell them as well. They're in propagation, so they're all safe. And you can literally have a plant and its own fossil right next to it, and it just boggles my brain. I'm just like, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so cool. Do you have any recommendations if someone wanted to try a moss or a lichen in their houseplant collection? Yeah. So the thing that a lot of people don't get right about mosses and lichens, and this is going to lead into the watering. The first thing, as I always say, is light. Mosses and lichens, like if you think about where they grow in nature, forget everything you learned from all the garden centers and things like that. They'll tell you that they're low light plants. They're not. They actually grow on the surfaces of rocks, like next to waterfalls. They're getting pretty exposed direct sunlight. The best thing you can do for your mosses is direct light and high humidity, high moisture, perpetually moist, the combo of that. And that's really the secret sauce to getting moss growing. Because I actually recently built a couple of months ago a vivarium with like a mister unit and some water inside and fans. And I'm just starting to get moss grow everywhere. It's like propagating itself. It's like going everywhere. So all you have to really do is provide good airflow, humidity, And I mean, I fans, but you can grow it in a terrarium, but you have to be careful of that. And the only other thing you have to be careful about with mosses, which I learned the hard way many, many times is pH. They're actually really sensitive to pH. So some mosses grow in acidic environments like sphagnum Mm -hmm. and other mosses like the cute little cushiony moss that you find in the sidewalk. Those grow in like more alkaline conditions. And so like if you're trying to grow the cute cushiony moss, which I love, but can't grow, you need like a chunk of limestone or concrete, which is basically ground up limestone and grow it on that so that the pH stays and changing water is ever good. You know, basic plant care stuff, change the water, make sure there's no mold growing, things like that. And you can grow moss, but light and constant humidity or moisture is definitely key with them. Awesome. Well, that brings us into our talk about watering and moisture because, you know, the more I talk to Bloom and Grow listeners, the more I recently did a survey with our Patreon community. And the thing that was so interesting to me was how much when I ask, what are you struggling with as a plant parent, watering really came up which is so interesting to me because I feel like everybody finds their own watering journey throughout their plants. I know personally, I'm a perpetual overwaterer and then also a perpetual underwaterer, depending like what mood and month that I'm in. Oh, same, same. (laughs) I never thought to dedicate a whole episode to the concept of watering, but it became very clear to me that it was time and that you would be the perfect guest. So Let's just start off with a broad question. You know, why is watering effectively so important for our plants? So it's really interesting because like water is the key to life. So Mm -hmm. you can't have life without water unless maybe you're some weird bacteria that lives in outer space, in which case not applicable. Mm -hmm. So plants are really giant straws, if you think about it. And plant cells, which they're made of, are little water balloons. And if you've ever looked at your eighth grade textbook or plant book or anything like that, that really gets into some plant physiology. About, I want to say roughly 60 to 80% of the entire plant cell volume is the vacuole. And the vacuole is filled with water and other soluble nutrients and things, but mostly water. And so this structure, actually many plants, herbaceous plants, which means plants that don't have wood, they actually use this water balloon and this water pressure to hold themselves up, which is why you may see a plant that's droopy. That's actually because those water balloons are starting to deflate. The water inside the vacuole is being all used up. How is it being used up? Well, this is where the straw part of the plant comes in, right? So if you've ever also seen those same textbooks right next to that plant cell diagram, you'll see cross sections of plants and you'll see things called xylem and things called phloem. Xi high, flow low. Xylem brings the oh, I love water that. and nutrients up. Oh yeah. Xylem brings the water and nutrients up. Phloem brings the sap back down. And you could think of this as like the plant vascular system, the plant circulatory system. Like we have veins and arteries, arteries which bring blood away from the heart veins, which bring blood back into the heart. You have xylem, which brings up and phloem, which goes low. So 
With that in mind, we also have to think about transpiration and humidity. So on plant leaves, now I'm just painting a broad picture. There's always cacti and succulents have their own model and orchids have their own model and ferns have their own model. But generally plants have leaves and on those leaves are little pores called stomata. And those stomata open and close based on time of day, dryness, all kinds of factors. And so what happens is during the day when the sun is beating down on the plant, it's actually evaporating water. And it's, that creates a cooling effect, which is really interesting. If you've ever gone barefoot on sand or barefoot on pavement or concrete, not fun when the sun's on. It's really hot. Yeah, but nope. if you go barefoot on grass, which is right next to that concrete, right? It's getting the same sun, same exposure. The grass is actually really nice to walk on. And why is that? It's because of the cooling effect of transpiration and also the fact that the plant is actually actively capturing that energy and turning it into sugars, which we all know is photosynthesis. So transpiration is if we're viewing, like you said, plants uptaking water like a straw and that plants are mostly water. Transpiration is the act of the plants releasing the water that they don't need, right? It's not an active process. That's the thing. A lot of people think it's active. Everything that a plant does water-wise is passive. Okay. Very, very little of it is active. There are some places where a plant will actively like push water from cell to cell, but generally it's the power of the sun that pulls the water through. And so I'm going to blow your minds in a second. So if your plant isn't getting enough light, you'll notice the soil doesn't dry as fast. And that's partly because the warmth and heat of the sun is not warming it up so it evaporates, but also the warmth and heat of the sun is not pulling that water through the plant to dry it out even faster. So when you move a plant from quote unquote low light, which I say never put plants in low light, but when you move a plant from lower light to a window where it gets some sunlight or even just bright ambient light, you have that transpirational effect. Wind also helps transpiration. So you have the wind that blows by and that wind, as it blows by, it creates, you know, sometimes it creates a little bit of a negative pressure, but it's taking those water molecules that are falling out of the stomata and it's sucking them out with it and it's creating a void. And of course, basic chemistry, basic physics, diffusion, things diffuse to where they are not. So more water from inside the plant starts coming out of the plant. So it's all passive. It's the power of the wind and the power of the sun that's actually pulling all of the water through and out of a plant. And when you say pulling, is it because there's more sun present? The plant is just performing more photosynthesis and therefore there's more transpiration happening? They're not coupled. They're not coupled processes. Okay. So photosynthesis can happen independent of transpiration. Okay. So, I mean, it's dependent on water, of course, but like transpiration happens regardless of whether or not photosynthesis oh. is happening. And transpiration in itself is somewhat dependent on sun availability. So just by right. increasing the sun availability, you're just going to increase transpiration completely separate than photosynthesis. Right. You could think of it like a beach towel, right? If I have a wet towel, if I put the wet towel out in the sun, it's going to dry faster than if I put the wet towel out in the shade. Perfect. Got it. That one sunk in. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's transpiration. Yes. And then one last thing is humidity with transpiration. Yes. Humidity will affect the rate at which transpiration happens. So if you have higher humidity, transpiration goes lower. You have low humidity, transpiration goes higher. And that makes sense because humidity is what? It's just the amount of water in the air. And if you've ever lived through a New York summer or a Florida summer, like Oof. 80, 90% humidity and like very, very hot. And like, it's kind of gross here in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> and gross. It is, but we go for like stretches of days and days and days without water. And because of the high humidity, the plants can last for a little longer. Now, I don't want to make it sound like you can, you have high humidity, you can stop watering your plants. That's not true. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is if you have high humidity, your plants can, they have the ability to last longer than if they had low humidity. So when a lot of people say, oh, I have a plant, it gets crispy tips all the time. I have a plant that like droops all the time. Like it gets crispy tips, not necessarily because of humidity, but perhaps because the humidity is low, it's running out of water really fast. And I've known a lot of quote unquote high humidity plants do just fine if you're really regular with the soil waterings. Because if you think about it, plants absorb their water through their roots. That is the number one way through which plants absorb water. You can spritz most of your plants all you like, unless it is an epiphyte or fern where it is kind of designed to absorb water through its skin. 
towards epidermis, it's not going to work. So you can spritz your pothos all you want. You can spritz your monstera all you want. They're not going to absorb water through their super, super waxy skin. If they have an aerial root, that might actually absorb some water. That's perfectly fine. They're designed to do that. But almost 100% of the water is absorbed from the soil. So you can get away with having something like a maidenhair fern, which I know everyone kills. I've killed many of them too, don't Mm -hmm. worry. And if you keep the soil evenly moist, now they're kind of finicky because they like a very narrow range of acceptable conditions. They're like, well, I want to be this wet, but not that wet. Mm -hmm. Like they're kind of like that. You can make them work in a lower humidity environment. I say lower than what you would normally think if you are diligent with the soil water. Now that's an example. There's other examples too, like different aroids. A lot of people are on the aroid bandwagon right now. They're like, oh, humidity this or humidity that. Honestly, humidity is the least of your problems and humidity is not really a major cause for most of the symptoms that people think is humidity. Like crispy tips are usually from actually your watering or your salts or something else rather than just humidity. So with this idea of transpiration, what kind of comes up is, you know, people talk a lot about microclimates and like grouping plants together to increase their humidity. And I know personally, when I go away for vacation for a week, I'll put all my plants on the same table. And I'm always shocked when I come home in a week and they're like the happiest they've ever been. Like all the peperomia are throwing off in fluorescence, like everybody's so happy. So can you talk a little bit about that concept of microclimates in regards to transpiration and humidity? Absolutely. That's a great point. And because of transpiration, because the water comes out of the plants through their leaves and their little stomatal pores, if you put a bunch of them next to one another, that's going to be an additive effect. You have the transpiration of one and another and another and all that water escaping. They will create that microclimate of like slightly higher humidity. Now, is it going to be something like big? No. Is it going to be just enough to help them? Yes. So if I were to assign a number to it, now I'm just spitballing numbers here. I would say you might get a 5% to 10% boost in humidity by um, having them all together, but you're not going to get like a super huge jump just because right. you're putting them together. Not unless you get a humidifier, which is like now it's making humidity. Mm-hmm. So, But it does make a little bit of a difference or it can. It does. It does. It mm-hmm. definitely does. It definitely helps. I've had some plants that I just kind of mush together. Like for my smaller orchids, like I have a lot of miniature orchids, which I'm sure you've seen me post lately. I just have so many of them and they're all coming into bloom at the same time. It's really great. And I actually keep them really close together. I recently posted a picture of my dendrobium all in a tray and I keep them all together, mushed together in that tray. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they need the same conditions so they can be together. They get the same amount of light. That's fine. And they love that humidity that they produce for one another. And so they do excellently like that. And with a terrarium or a vivarium, it's the same basic principle, except now you have a glass enclosure to help keep the water from escaping. Now, do you want a plant to be completely enclosed in a terrarium or vivarium? Never. You always want some kind of breathing because plants breathe just like we do. They also respire. And just because they make oxygen doesn't mean that they don't also take in oxygen. They have to break the sugars back down in order to feed themselves so that they can grow. So you definitely still want to have your plants, terrariums and vivariums have an opening so that they can breathe. Yeah. I think that's interesting what you said about grouping because especially to, I think a great watering hack is if you choose to have plants that need to be watered or misted, like say you want to have a bunch of ferns or a bunch of marantaceae, it makes Mm -hmm. sense to put them all together. Okay. Yes. The transpiration will help with a subtle microclimate change, but also then, you know, you only have to go to one place to water all of the plants that require daily watering or a couple of every days where like my succulents I can put on the shelf that I don't visit every day because I know I don't have to check in on them every day. Exactly. So let's mark throughout our conversation, the watering hacks that we discussed. So watering hack number one, group plants together with similar watering conditions. So you don't forget or miss anybody. Exactly. Exactly. And I have so many plants, like anyone who's had a lot of plants always like, there's like one that like wiggles its way into the back and like you forget about it. And it's like, oh no, I thought I watered you. And it's like, yeah, no, you didn't. Like if you put them all together, one stop shop, everybody. And if you're a schedule keeper, like more power to you, you can keep them all on the same, the same schedule. But yeah, absolutely. That is one of my bigger hacks. I keep like with like, I keep the drier things with the drier things, the wetter things with the wetter things and everybody in between with everybody in between. 
So smart. I love it. So let's dive into like the general watering. So I want to talk to you about top watering best practices and then bottom watering best practices, because those are the two main ways. And then we'll get into some root rot issues and stuff like that. But talk to me about what are the best practices for top watering our plants, which is the normal standard way to water your plants. So when it comes to watering, top watering, bottom watering, I do have a preference. I personally have a preference and a very strong opinion, but I'll talk about both. Given top or bottom watering, always go for top watering. Because if you think about it, best way to make a plant happy is to recreate its natural environment. And Mm -hmm. it always rains from the sky. So it makes sense that you would want to evenly moisten the entire media by watering from the top. Now, that doesn't mean that bottom watering doesn't have its place. It totally does. If you have your plant planted in sphagnum, there's a couple of plants that I do bottom water and it's because they're planted in something like sphagnum, which like immediately becomes homogenous. Like if one part of the sphagnum is wet, it immediately makes, or not immediately, but it makes the rest of the sphagnum just as wet. It's a very good like spongy type material that just like totally can become even. But potting mix and orchid mix and other things like that they don't wick the water up as well. So bottom watering isn't really great for plants planted and stuff like that. So do consider your media. When you're top watering, I have two preferred methods. And my first preferred method, really, if you don't have a lot of plants, this is probably best for you. Take your plant away from where it is, bring it to the sink, put it in the sink. Hopefully it has a drainage hole. It should always have a drainage hole. And just run warm water through it. And just like put the faucet on slow, run warm water through it. Try not to get the dirt to fall out because, you know, sometimes the soil like pops out and goes everywhere. But just try to add just enough so that it goes through and it's going through at a nice rate and it's not overflowing. And you see water coming through the bottom. Keep going. Keep that going for like another minute to 30 seconds just so that you know it's evenly moist. Set it aside. Do your next plant. Do your next plant. Do your next plant. Then repeat one more time. The first time around in the sink was to pre-moisten, what I call pre-moisten the soil. And then the second time around is to actually saturate it. Because if you think of what happens in a rainstorm, everything is wet. It totally gets saturated. Regard, and you'll hear people, they'll say, oh, but succulents don't need that. They do. Succulents need, every plant needs just as much water during a watering as every other plant. When it rains in the desert, it pores. And I know because I've been caught in one of those. It's like Mm -hmm. the sky is falling, like OMG. And when it rains here in New York, we have a tropical storm or even just a regular thunderstorm. It just rains and it rains here, it rains all day. So there's no way that things aren't getting totally saturated. The key where people go wrong is they kind of leave it sitting in the water. The thing about nature is nature, it drains off, it gets dry, the sun comes out, dries everything out pretty quickly. But indoors, you don't have that wind. You don't have as powerful of sun strength. So you need to make sure that that plant dries out as good as possible. And this is why the sink method is pretty good because you saturate it, right? Regardless of whether it's a succulent or a fern or an orchid or anything, you saturate it and it has the drainage hole. Then you put it back to where it lives, You don't let it sit in the water. You don't let the water sit in the tray. You just let it dry. And that works for me. And that's one of my most foolproof methods of watering for just about anything. And it'll dry out. If it's in a terracotta pot, it'll dry out even faster. And you just check on it every couple of days. And oh, right. One of the biggest things I forgot to mention at the beginning was before you even think about adding water, you should always stick your finger in the soil, feel the soil. I always get like, questions like, oh, how do I know when to water? Or do I water this every seven days or every 10 days? Get numbers out of your head. Just check on it every couple days, every two, three days, stick your finger in. If it's moist, don't touch it. If it's wet, definitely don't touch it. And if it's dry, then you can water. And it's really as simple as that. I'm so happy you said that because I think a big transition for me from the beginning of my plant journey where like I would buy a plant and get the care card and like live and die by the care card. And of course, I understand why these care cards and these plant companies have to put water every couple of weeks. You have to give someone some place to start, but every apartment is so different. My Boston fern is going to dry out. If we watered each of our Boston ferns with two cups of water, Mine is going to dry out not the same exact time yours does because the nature of our environments are different. So it's so much more important to kind of take that 
power, not take the power back, but like, it's so important (laughs) to empower yourself to make your own decisions and understand the concepts behind watering to know how to water effectively and not just water every seven days because that's what the internet told you. You know what I mean? Exactly. I always encourage people think for yourself, you're special, your environment is special. So use these principles to guide you. The numbers are just a suggestion. They're not to live or die by. They're kind of based on like an average of what the plant companies think you'll need to water. But if your apartment's hot and dry, then you'll be watering more often than if you live in a basement where you don't get as much light or heat. So let's take many of the aeroid, like not a maiden hair fern, not any ferns, but many of the aeroids that we get, many of the, I'm trying to think other plants, but when the instructions say water when it dries out, what does that look like? Or should I be sticking my finger in the soil and it should be completely dry to my first knuckle, to my second knuckle? Like when, I guess, so for when to water, like what does dry look like? Because personally, sometimes I've waited too long and then the soil has become so dry and compact that rehydrating the soil becomes really difficult. So can you speak to that? Right, exactly. Yeah, so when you're feeling the soil for dryness, you want to touch the top at least first you first you want to touch the top just as like a quick like because if it's wet then the top's going to be wet and then you say okay well if the top's dry let me go in a little further and depending on the size of the plant like if it's like a small four inch plant maybe you can only afford to go down maybe one knuckle one and a half knuckles but if it's like a huge like 10 inch plant and when i say inches i mean pot diameter i do not mean plant height Mm -hmm. you stick like i stick my whole finger down in my large floor plants i just stick my whole finger down i just go all the way in and A lot of them actually, the bigger the pot, especially with the non-draining pots, you have to be careful because the water tends to pool at the bottom. The top will be completely dry. You'll get an entire finger down. It'll be totally dry, but the bottom will be totally wet. So with the floor plants, you kind of have to use a little more like experience and gut. I always tell people, take care of the small ones first. So you get a hang of the basic rules and like how often you should be checking in and things like that. Then go for the big boys. So That's sort of my recommendation. And I know some soils kind of feel like in between, what do I do if I'm not sure if it's dry or wet? Cause like, it'll feel cool. And Mm -hmm. you're not sure if that's like Mm -hmm. cool cause it's wet or cool cause it's cool. There's several other methods. You could take like a little soil sample from down. You can like kind of pinch from like a couple inches underneath the soil. You could kind of squeeze it between your fingers. If it feels really moist or if water comes out, then it's still really wet. Like if it sticks to your finger. That's kind of helpful if it sticks to your finger. Like really sticky, yeah. And you like see like, oh, my finger is like starting to change color because like it's bleeding like the soil color on it or I don't know. I've also known some people to use pot weight, which I think is another really good, like if you're not good at feeling or you're really unsure about feeling or you don't want to get your hands dirty, I don't know why that would be, but (laughs) (laughs) you can also, right after you water your plants, give that pot a lift just so that you kind of have a baseline as... This is what my plant feels like when it is saturated. And then go a couple days later and just keep feeling it and just kind of like pick it up and just kind of like jiggle it up and down so you feel like how heavy it is. If it feels really light, it needs water. If it feels really heavy compared to when you first water it, like if it still kind of feels that heavy, then be like, okay, well, this probably doesn't need as much water or I could wait a couple more days. Or you can even look at the plant too. Sometimes plants are what I call very vocal. They're vocal plants, pothos very vocal plant. It will start to droop as it wants water. Hit it the moment that it starts drooping with water and you won't lose any leaves and you'll be golden. A lot of aroids are like that. Ferns will start to go pale if they need water. Orchids and succulents actually, because many orchids are succulents. They'll get wrinkles Mm -hmm. and wrinkles just like my skin wrinkles. I need to moisturize. You need to dunk your plants or water your plants when they start to wrinkle too. And there's all sorts of little signs if you like really pay attention. I could go on and on and on about each individual plant and what its exact needs are, but that would take forever. So just follow the general rules and you should be fine. So we had a listener, Emily, ask, I go to the garden centers and they recommend to water with half a cup or a third a cup of water. But then I hear that you're supposed to water until water runs out of the bottom of the pot. So which is the right way? I would say kind of kind of neither because the one could be right for some situations and the other could be right for other situations. So if we go back to the sink watering model, you want to keep going until like it comes through, but you don't want it to just like, oh, it just started coming through now. I'm going to stop. 
you want it to keep going through for a little while because as we all know, when soil gets really dry, as you've said, it becomes water repellent almost. It becomes really hard to get moist again. So you wanna make sure that it's running a little extra, especially in the sink there. And there are other plants, like if you're maybe more experienced or maybe you happen to get a plant this way, there are plants in non-draining containers, which if you can grow like that, you can grow like that, that's fine. And because there's no drainage, you have to use a finite amount of water. And what I always say is one third of the pot's volume. So you have to use a little bit of your imagination based on the shape of the pot. So you take the pot, you kind of figure out what one third of that is, and then you try to visualize that in terms of filling a glass of, or really a jug of water, and then just dumping that in and stopping. See, the hard part for me, and I've actually more overwatered in planters with no drainage because I'll be like, hmm, still looks a little dry, hmm, still looks a little dry, still looks a little dry, and then, oh my God, it's a pool. <laughs> it's swimming in I'm, water. Ever since I took Soil Science 101 with New York Botanical Garden, I've been like pretty outspoken about how I've like fully shifted to only using pots with holes at the bottom. Because I just feel like, especially for beginners, I just feel like you're not setting yourself up for success by using containers with no drainage. People do it. They do it successfully. I have done it successfully. But I just feel like the better, more successful, easier way to care for plants is to have a drainage hole at the bottom. Or use a nursery pot inside of a cash po. Like at least go that route. Yeah, that works too. And that hints at the second way, which I don't think I mentioned of watering, which is you can take a plant and you can take a watering can. Like let's say you can't bring it to the sink. You would just slowly add the warm water. It has to be warm over the top of the pot and then you just let it slowly soak in and then you wait a minute and then you water it again, let it slowly soak in, then you water it again. The distance between the top of the soil and the lip of the pot, you should fill that each time until it starts to come through the bottom and you should have a tray. And then once it starts to come in through the tray, then you stop watering and you just wait and you wait and see. This method takes more time, of course. You wait and see. If the tray fills up, then you stop or you just add a little more water. You just guesstimate how much water you need to fill the tray. Let the container soak in the tray for about a day or two. Usually, especially if it's terracotta, the tray will get soaked up. I'm so happy you mentioned that. And then you don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. But if it's still sitting in water after like a day or two, you have to dump it. But also that's a hint to you, hint, hint, I may be using too much water because it's still sitting in water after a couple of days. Okay. So basically you're saying almost it's like a top bottom combo where you're going to top water it. So the dish at the bottom fills up and then you're essentially going to allow that pot to quote unquote bottom water for a day exactly to make sure that it gets all the water it needs. And then the most crucial point is to dump the water after the first day. So your plants don't potentially get root rot. Exactly. Soltec Solutions for supporting today's episode. Plant friends, Soltec Solutions makes luxury full spectrum LED grow lights to keep our houseplants happy and healthy indoors. We know I love them so very much. And as winter is approaching, I know it's only September, but winter is coming and available light is going to start diminishing, it's a great time to start thinking about upping your grow light game. So I have had three of their aspect pendant style lights in my house for I think over three years years now. They illuminate all of our dark corners and make them these highlight havens for a ton of plants. And right now, as I record this episode, I'm looking at Figaro, our fiddle leaf fig, who is hanging on my desk under a Soltec light. And he is so happy throwing off so much new growth. So Soltec has two different types of lights, the aspect light that I just talked about, which is their sleek pendant style hanging light. And then they also have their Highland light, which is the first of its kind LED track light, which is perfect for illuminating green walls, plants that might be in hard to reach places, or even large plants that need light from the sides. Both types of lights are so easy to install. They come with everything you need, and they look so modern and sleek. They really just look like any other type of sexy modern light fixtures that you would have in any beautiful home in any magazine. But... They have the highly precise photosynthetic spectrum that's museum quality white lighting to keep our plant babies happy and our homes looking lovely. 
I also love the fact that all the lights come with a timer for the light, so you just set it and forget it. I have mine on a 12 hours on, 12 hours off system right now, and I love they wake me up in the morning. It's actually a really nice way to wake up. So whether it's simply getting through the lower light winter, or if you're like me and you have way too many plants and too few windows and you need to bring more artificial light indoors so your collections can keep growing, Soltech Solutions has the lighting option for you. Soltech is offering Bloom and Grow Radio listeners 20% off with code 20BLOOM, 20BLOOM at SoltechSolutions.com. So once again, use the code 20BLOOM at SoltechSolutions.com for 20% off one of their sexy lights. All right, back to Chris. Okay, so let's talk about bottom watering because I will say I'm actually like obsessed with bottom watering. So it's interesting to hear that you don't like it because for me, I find bottom watering, it's just easy for me to water like a lot of plants at once because I'll like set up a big thing right. of water and I'll put all my pots in a big in a tub tray of water. Mean, right? Or a tub, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a tub or a tray or like some sort of Pyrex, like glad Tupperware type moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first off, the concept of bottom watering is you have a vessel with water and you actually insert your pot with a hole in the bottom that's smaller than the vessel in the vessel of water. And through capillary action, the soil will wick up the amount of water that it needs. In theory, How do you feel about that? I was going to say in theory, yes, but I've seen so many time and time and time again that just it doesn't evenly saturate the media. Like unless it's sphagnum, like the top of the soil will still be like this dry crust. And I've done this before and I still do this. I just throw water on top just to make sure, but I'll still soak them. So like if you do bottom watering, definitely combo it with some top watering to get it nice and evenly moist. This is very interesting because some people think bottom watering is like the fail proof, like easy thing. But I do think there is definitely a technique that you just brought up with bottom watering because I also, as someone who bottom waters so many of my plants, especially mm -hmm. plants that are in a deeper pot. So you're putting your pot in the water, the soil right. is going to be light brown. So for me, I wait until I see the soil turn dark brown on top because that means that the whole soil has been hydrated. But it is interesting that sometimes that doesn't happen and sometimes only parts of the soil on the top are dark brown. And then I do have to go in and give a little top watering to make sure everybody is happy, everybody's wet. Exactly. So it's interesting to know the problems associated with bottom watering that maybe people don't talk about. And that's totally one of them. Yeah. That and also one of my other problems with bottom watering is, and this is just a me thing, it makes more of a mess because if you have a plant that's super ultra, like double dry, like it's on death's door, but you know, if you water it, it'll totally perk back up. It's so lightweight. It just kind of starts floating away and then it like topples mm -hmm. over to the side and then it just starts mm -hmm. making a mess. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, because for me, bottom watering, I'm like, oh, I'm setting them to sail off somewhere. <laughs> like, unless right, because sometimes they something. float. That's true, too. I've definitely had to, like, find the perfect angle. I find if I bottom water and I actually put the pots on a slight angle. That helps, yeah. Then it reveals their bottom hole into the water more. So, Because sometimes if you put it right into a pot of water, then that hole almost gets Curl sealed deception. at the bottom of the pot. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. water can't get in. So yeah, I have all these like weirdo techniques for bottom watering because I'm that lazy. Like I just like force it to work. But another negative thing about bottom watering I think people have to be wary of is with the water that we're using that sometimes has a lot of minerals in it that our plants don't mm -hmm. like. If you exclusively bottom water your plants, then you're always bringing those minerals up and you don't give your top watering an opportunity to completely wash all those minerals out. Because when we top water and the water goes through the bottom of the pot, that's also a way to flush the soil and kind of flush exactly. the plant out. So if you are someone like me, like I bottom water my plants once a month, especially with the plants that I like to let dry out and also sometimes let them dry out too much and then have to kind of resaturate <laughs> the soil. I do find bottom watering is helpful sometimes when the soil is so hard that you can't even top water it. But I definitely, for every one time that I bottom water, I'll top water the next three times. And then I'll bottom water, give it like a good saturation, and then I'll top water the next three times. What do you think about that? Totally, 100% with you. Like, yes. Just one last thing. I'm not sure if it's like, I mean, it's a bottom watering thing, but it's not necessarily a bottom watering thing. It's more of like a group plant tray thing. Mm -hmm. Like 
You can bottom water if they're in like individual saucers or dishes or whatever you want to call them. I like that personally because if you trade water, what happens is if one plant has a disease or a fungus or a something, they're all going to have that disease or fungus or something because they're all sitting in the same water. And that's how many, many diseases like your root rot and all damping off and all the other diseases that plants get spread from one plant to another plant. And you may, and you may not get an infection, but you may get something later down the line. So, I mean, I still trade water a whole bunch of plants. Don't get me wrong. Like once I have a plant population that I know to be disease free, yeah. like my new plants do not mix with my old plants water wise until I'm convinced that they're like totally disease free. But if you are someone who just kind of like, Oh, impulse purchases plants and then throws them all together, you may want to be careful because not only do you have like insects hopping around from the tops of the leaves to all one another, because now they're all together, but you may also have like fungi from the soil, just kind of like swimming through the water and going to all the other plants. So I think that's more of a group watering thing, which yeah, I guess is Yeah, that's really interesting. Watering. I didn't think about that. This conversation is definitely making me reframe how I view watering. Cause I think that you're right with top watering. It's how plants get their water in real life from the top. So I think like, especially with beginners, like learn to nail top watering first. And you'll be successful. Yeah. And then understand bottom watering and use it when you want to. And maybe there are plants that you specifically like to bottom water. Maybe occasionally you like to bottom water, but nail top watering first and then use bottom watering as a technique when you need it. And that's definitely Absolutely. how I've used it. I mean, I only started bottom watering in like after my first six months of plant parenthood. And now it's very useful for me, but I also know all those negative things and I'm like very wary to like flush the plant. And that's interesting too about, I've never thought about the water potentially sharing fungi and stuff or disease. That's really interesting. Yeah. So this brings up perfectly. So I want to talk to you about root rot. I mean, people say you overwater your plant and then it gets root rot. So what is root rot? How does it happen to our plants and how mm -hmm. do we fix it and avoid it? So I would say, first off, a lot of what people think is, and this is one of my biggest pet peeves ever. So I'm going to go on like a slight rant for a second. A lot of people think they've overwatered and a lot of people think they have root rot when it's really just their plant has died for an unknown reason. Oh, I don't know why it died. I must have overwatered. And for people like me and for people who are at garden centers and people who are trying to help you, we are very frustrated when everyone's like, oh, I've overwatered this plant. Because actually a lot of times, I mean, half the time I've seen people send me pictures of plants, they've underwatered it. But because, you know, underwatering and overwatering both give you yellow leaves, too hot, too cold give you yellow leaves, basically anything can give you a yellow leaf. People think, oh, I've overwatered when really, oh no, it's winter and you've left the window slightly open and didn't move your plants or, oh, it's fall time and your radiators kicked on or your heat kicked on and now suddenly your plant is dying. So like before you assume a diagnosis, really go through your environment and say, is this truly the cause? Because if you've overwatered your plant, stick your finger in the soil, it will still be wet and it might even smell. And you'll also get those fun friends called fungus gnats and those fungus gnats will kind of take over. So if you have gnats, you've probably overwatered. If your plant smells weird or is mushy at the base, you've probably actually overwatered, which leads into root rot. Well, that actually brings up an interesting listener question. Rebecca wants to know, how do you differentiate over versus underwatering? Because so many of the things say, oh, your leaves are brown, you've either over or underwatered your plant. Oh, your leaves are yellow, you've over or underwatered your plant. Oh, your leaves are droopy, you've over or underwatered your plant. So can you give us three telltale signs of each? Your number one North Star is going to be your soil moisture. If you've underwatered, your soil is going to be hard, it's going to be lightweight, it's going to be totally dry if you feel it. And you're also going to notice that the stems or the petioles will kind of be sunken in on themselves and they'll snap because okay. they're super dry. If you've overwatered, it might smell bad, your soil is going to be wet, you might have fungus gnats. Like if you've overwatered, you will have fungus gnats. If you've underwatered, you probably won't have fungus gnats. That's like, because they can't live without moisture and you know, there's no moisture. Your plant may also collapse a little from the base because of that mushiness. Because what happens during overwatering, right, is you have so much water in the ground 
that not only are the roots suffocating, but also that's water pressure. The plant doesn't pull water through. Water gets pulled through or water pushes through. So when you have too much water in the soil, that water actually starts to push through the plant and it creates so much pressure that it starts to rupture all of those xylem and phloem. It's kind of like when your veins and arteries start exploding from too high blood pressure. I mean, that's extreme, but mm-hmm. that's what's going on there in the plant. And you have that happening. And that's why they start to go mushy because once those vessels start exploding, the structural integrity goes down. It starts to get mushy. It starts to break down. It's like when all your pipes start exploding, bad news. So you'll get those telltale signs. And there may be fungus on the soil too. There may be things that go together, birds of a feather, you know, birds of an overwatering tend to rot together, I guess. (laughs) I love that. So Overwatering and root rot, are they synonymous? So that's what's happening when root rot happens? Ish. I would say most of the time, yeah. I mean, you can overwater something. The roots don't necessarily have to be rotting. Like you could be just in the realm of like, oh, I gave it a little too much water and it's starting to drop a few leaves, in which case you can still save it. If it's a non-draining plant, tilt the plant on its side so that all that excess water just kind of drains off the side. If it's a planter with drainage, immediately move it into the sunniest position in your home that you have. Or if you don't have some place that's too sunny, a place with heat. Of course, be reasonable with your heat. Like don't put it on top of like, or next to your stove where it like gets blasted with 200 degrees of heat and then expect it Mm -hmm. to be okay. That's still not okay. But like place it in a warmer spot where you'll get that kind of uh, reaction. Okay. I save a place under one of my grow lights for resuscitation because I actually overwatered a couple of snake plants, ironically. (laughs) So I overwatered them or they got overwatered And basically I was noticing these plants were looking droopy and weird and I went to inspect their roots and there were no roots left. Like there were almost no roots left. And so what happened was the roots rotted and then actually like dissolved into the soil as like organic matter. And these plants were in the darkest areas of my apartment, not the darkest, but for plant context, they were in like medium light. And so as a way to resuscitate them, I immediately put them under the brightest lights that I had to help them try and like shoot more energy to grow more roots. And actually this was very successful for me. (laughs) So yeah, that works. It was so interesting that when I went to inspect the roots to be like, what's going on with these snake plants? There actually were no roots left. And I was like, where did the roots go? And then I figured out they had dissolved, like disintegrated. They had rotted away, yeah. (laughs) They literally rotted away. Because I think sometimes you say like, how do you identify root rot if the roots are brown? Mm -hmm. And people say, okay, trim the brown roots away. Hopefully you have some healthy pink ones and it'll regenerate. And I was like, oh no, I have no brown. That's not necessarily true because there are many plants that are totally healthy and they have brown roots. That's just the color of their roots. So do not go by color of the roots unless it is black. Black is always a color of death. So like if something is black, then it is dead. But if it's brown or any other color, it's probably okay. Like don't start trimming roots. Like I very rarely in my entire indoor growing, I guess, career, you want to call it, have really trimmed roots. Like when I repot, I rip some roots off. I loosen the roots. I don't go and actively trim my roots because just in case of the event where I do screw up, where I say, okay, oops, I've overwatered and now they've started to rot. Or in the case of many orchids and even some like other plants, like you haven't watered in so long. And I've had this happen to me with succulents. You haven't watered in so long that the roots actually just crisped up and died. Like they dried to death, which like I picked up the succulent and there were no roots left because I hadn't watered it in so long. The plant was like, well, I don't need roots anymore. I got it to reroot later because it's a succulent and they do that. But like, there's also that too. Two different sides of the same coin. It's, they're both water issues and the plant kind of, you see similar things, but you'll notice the telltale differences. One is dry and crispy and snaps. The other one's just kind of mushy and dissolved away, as you said. Kind of slimy. So for root rot, put it in the brightest light you can. If you don't, put it near some heat and pair back on the watering. Try and get as much moisture out. Let that just stop dry watering out. it until the soil dries out. Do not add any more water until that soil is bone dry. And if you think it is dry, wait another day. Wait another day. Wait another day. If you're not sure, wait another day. Because it's easier (laughs) to save a plant when it's thirsty than if it starts to rot. Because you can't get rid of rot. But you can like perk it up. And even if the plant takes some damage because it's too dry, like, oh no, I've lost a couple of leaves. Or, oh no, now they all have crispy tips. Like, 
it will grow new leaves. It will be fine. That's much better than like a dead plant. Totally. The same thing for me happened. I mean, I learned a lot. I'm like a cereal over water. The same thing happened. I had a treasured variegated watermelon peperomia that fully rotted and I couldn't save it. But what I ended up doing, I feel like when all else fails, just propagate the plant too. Like if you can't right. save the roots, I just propagated every single stem and it's on my Instagram live or my YouTube if mm-hmm. people want to see the process, but I propagated everything. I water rooted it and then I just potted it up and it took a while for the plant to like establish again, but now it's super happy and thriving and like the plant lives on. So I feel like also just because your plant succumbs to root rot doesn't mean you can at least save part of it at the end of the day. Exactly. And especially with orchids too, like your store bought grocery store orchids or even some of the more hardcore orchids out there. Like they're epiphytes, they grow on trees, their roots are exposed. They're so used to like, oh, a squirrel gnawed off my root today. So now I have to grow off a new root or, oh my God, the tree branch that was shading me fell. And now I'm exposed to full sun. Now my roots right. are fried and I fell off and now I got to reroot somewhere else. Like they will grow new roots. Totally. And of course, certain plants are better at regenerating their roots than others. But you know, orchids are a fabulous example of that. I've seen so many root rotted orchids where like, I just wrap them in paper towels. I wrap some of them in paper towels and it, they're very easy to moist because paper towels go wet dry very fast, which is exactly what you want when you're trying to coax out a root mm, for any plant. Super helpful. So any quick thoughts on self-watering pots and those like watering orbs that you can like buy on the internet and like fill with water and then flip upside down in your plant? So I have a very strong opinion about that. Okay. <laughs> and I say, look, anything that encourages you to not think about your plant, to neglect your plant, to make it like a piece of furniture. That is not good plant parenting. You're going to forget all your techniques. You're going to forget like, oh, is this what wet soil feels like? I don't quite remember. Is this what like, is this dry enough kind of soil? Like you forget your techniques and you also forget to check in. And when you forget to check in, all the other problems start happening. OMG, you didn't check in enough and now suddenly your plant's covered in spider mites or you didn't check in enough and now suddenly, oh, you missed that flower that it had. You know, that's a good thing. You missed it because you weren't even looking at it. You weren't paying attention to it. So I say anything like the self-watering pots, the aqua orbs, like if you're traveling, like sure, go wild with the aqua orbs. Like I've heard actually really great stories with those and trays and things like that. But self-watering pots, don't do it. It's just better to take care. And also like you're in plants because you love plants. Why would you want to like push them over there and like not love them as much? I just don't understand that. So like go in there, do it. Get in there. Yes. Get in there with your watering. Yes. I have some opinions about this too. I want to share debate with you. Okay. Lovingly. Well, it's not even debating, but because I actually agree with you. So I got sent some self-watering pots that worked Mm -hmm. great. They're wonderful pots, Mm -hmm. but Because none of my other collection of 100 plants was in a self-watering pot, what I noticed, and this happened routinely for me, I would fill up the pot and then I would forget about it because that's what you're supposed to do with self-watering pots. And there was a fern in it. And I would forget about it for too long until I saw the fern was like almost dead. And that's because I let the pot water levels completely dry out and the fern completely dry out. So then I had to like rehydrate the fern refill the water level. And then I would forget about it again. And then the same thing happened. So it was just this like continual cycle of me killing the fern. Whereas if I just had the fern in a normal pot, I think I would be more intentional with watering it. So my feeling about self-watering pots is for me, they don't work. Or for me, I haven't cracked the code for how I can incorporate them into my collection. But If someone had their whole plant collection in self-watering pots where they knew once a week they were refilling the water reservoir or once every two weeks, like say a consultant who travels four days a week and is never home and you have your whole collection in that type of pot, that I get because then you're at least in the routine of refilling the water and you're in that routine of like knowing how to care for that plant. Whereas for me, it actually just like, oh, I'll get a self-watering pot for my ferns because I kill ferns and this will solve that problem where it actually just like exacerbated that problem for me. I think they're super interesting though, like for people and also like for people who maybe do just want plants for more of an aesthetic purpose in their home, which I hope they 
grows into more wellness, emotional, but maybe they do that people who travel are like not care as much than I get it. But it is really interesting. And obviously, like if you travel a lot, that's just like the easiest and those watering orbs and all those watering hacks. But I do think they're really interesting. I love what you said about like as much as you can gear away from treating a plant like a design piece and understanding that they're living and wanting to nurture it. Like I love your intention behind that. And I love that that's kind of the boundaries that you set for yourself and how you educate. I love that. Right. Because it's all about good intentions. Like, why are we all doing this? We're doing this because, I mean, we love the aesthetic of the plants. You know, they make me feel good. I love them. I love when they flower. I love when they grow. I love when they do anything. It's just fabulous. But I also just love them genuinely. They're fascinating creatures. We live on this earth with these wonderful creatures that give us so much and they request so little. Like, that blows me away. Yeah. So that's why I'm just like, don't treat your plant like a piece of furniture. You know, do give it that love. But There are times and places for self-watering pots, absolutely, like you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. But I do want to point out also that self-watering pots, I don't know if this is going to blow any minds or not, but it's really just a glorified bottom watering. There's no automation. It's just the water sitting at the bottom. You're just perpetually bottom watering your plant in like a slightly more complicated way. Well, I'm thinking of the ones where the string, it's like the string sits in the water and then the string also sits in the soil. So the damp string is like dampening the soil. Those are the ones that I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's still basically the water's at the bottom and the string wicks it up and then the soil absorbs it. So it's like a more complicated bottom watering or a bottom watering with an extra step, if that makes sense. So that it's not like drowning in water, but it's still moist enough. Yeah. If it works for you, it works for you. But for those who are just kind of starting to feel their way, I would say spend more time with your plants and try to master that. I agree. I love it. Okay. I can't believe how long we've talked. I have a couple more listener questions for you. Sure. Well, first off, let's just talk quickly about spritzing. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like spritzing actually increases humidity? So here's the deal about spritzing, and I'm going to bust a lot of myths, and I'm going to make a lot of people very upset, and that's okay. I know. Let's do it. (laughs) Go for it. Spritzing does not increase humidity. Spritzing just puts water on the plant. If you want a long scientific explanation, you can ask me later. But basically what you're doing is it'll be higher humidity for like the five minutes that that spritz is on the plant, and then the moment it evaporates, your room humidity is like exactly the way it was when you started. So it's a Band-Aid. It's not a cure. And even as a Band-Aid, it's not a very good one because it doesn't even stick on. So, (laughs) and then also on top of spritzing, like you get the potential to give those foliar fungi a chance to jump from plant to plant through the spritz because that's how their spores spread in nature. They go in these water droplets and they use the water droplets to stick their little spory feelers inside stomata and infect leaves that way. That's how many plant fungi. And a lot of things that people think are like dead crispy leaf tips are actually fungal infections. Like, oh, my fiddle leaf fig has these like crispy tips or oh, my calathea has these crispy tips nine times out of 10. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen calatheas. And I took one look at them and I said, that is a fungus that is not humidity related. I've grown calathea before. I've given them away, but I've grown them before. I've had no problems with their foliage because the ones that I made sure I sprayed them down with a fungicide, once I hit them with a fungicide, they stopped having the crispy leaves. And also I kept the soil moist, of course, but you can tell the difference between a fungus and a humidity related damage or a water related damage by the shape of the crispiness on the leaf. If it's irregular, if it's on one side, but not the other side, if it's on random leaves, or if it's like on a bunch of leaves over here, but not over there, if it's asymmetrical, it is something that is living that is causing that, meaning a fungus is causing it, a bacteria is causing it, something living. If it is evenly crispy around all the edges, and I don't mean like starting on one side and then eventually going around to the other side, that's just spread. If it starts and goes around very evenly and it dies in a very calculated way, almost geometrical how it dies, that is low humidity. And not only that, but low humidity damage affects all the leaves. Fungal damage affects, at least in the beginning stages, just some of the leaves. So if you have a watering problem, your whole plant's going to be affected. If you have a humidity problem, your whole plant's going to be affected. And it's going to be affected in the exact same way or relatively the same way on every single leaf as opposed to that stuff. Now, That being said, there are some plants that love, 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 need, 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 have to be spritzed. And 
Orchids are one of them. Anything that has an aerial root, anything that is an epiphyte, meaning it grows on a tree in nature, those are your tillandsia air plants, those are your orchids, some ferns, lichens, mosses, things like that, they need to be spritzed because they actually have special structures to directly absorb water and moisture from their epidermis, orchids especially. And for things that have aerial roots, spritz the you know what out of those aerial roots. You got a monstera with some aerial roots, you spritz those aerial roots because it's a root. It can absorb water. That's what roots are for. And so that actually, I found my monstera do way better. And all of my plants with aerial roots do way better when I just spritz the aerial roots. And so those are the times when you want to spritz and those are the times when you don't want to spritz. So I hope that. Oh my God. Chris, I feel like I need to pull that five minutes and make it a separate (laughs) podcast episode because you just like dropped, I mean, come on the brown edges fungus versus humidity. That is so interesting and so useful. So with your permission, I'm going to pull it and have it as an isolated episode as well. (laughs) I'll keep it in this episode, but I'm going to isolate it for the listeners because people are going to want to go back to that tidbit. And you can also throw in like, oh, my variegated whatever, the white parts of the variegation. Like if you have a variegated monstera, the white parts always turn brown. That's a fungus. I've recently actually posted pictures on my Instagram botanic tonic. Shout out. My Monstera, I spritzed it with fungicide. I don't have any brown spots or brown tips on my white leaves anymore. I have perfectly formed white variegated leaves and there's no brown spots. There's no brown tips. There's nothing on them and they're perfectly fine. So I have proven at least with my one small sample size test case, but also I've done this on plants in the greenhouse too. It is a fungus and a lot of fungi mimic that. So you have a fungicide spray? Yes. Okay. So you try spraying with the fungicide and see if the crispy edges go away. Exactly. And well, in the new growth, they go away because in the old growth, you know, once it's dead, it's dead, but you spritz everywhere so that it doesn't spread. And then you spritz the new growth and then the new growth should be quote unquote sterile or as sterile as it's going to be. And then as the new leaf unfurls, if it unfurls and then you don't want to spritz your plant at all. Like if your plant has a fungal problem, stop spritzing. Like just go back to plain old, like top or bottom watering and just touch the roots. Don't splash the water. Be very careful, especially when you bring it to the sink, try not to get the leaves wet at all, just the roots, just the soil or whatever media it's potted in and you should be okay. Oh my God. Obsessed. Thank you for that amazing breakdown. Try that out. Try that out with your calathea. Spritz it with a fungicide. You will see some gorgeous new calathea leaves. Huh? I'm so curious. I'm definitely going to try that. I have an espoma fungicide. I'll try it on. Yep. Okay. Three more questions for you. Two of them are combined. Cynthia wants to know, does the temperature of the water really matter? And Taylor wants to know what's up with using ice cubes to water your plants. So these are like two part question. Oh my God. The second one hurts me a little. I'll go into that in a second. I know it does. The first one is always use warm water because most of your house plants are tropical plants. There's no such thing as cold water in the tropics. And also you don't want to shock your plant. The rain is warm. Yeah, yeah. And like, I don't want to jump into a cold pool. Your plants don't want to be watered with cold water. Give them warm water. It also absorbs faster into the soil. So warm water all the way. Love it. And then ice cubes. That is like a really dirty thing that the plant industry started telling people to kill their orchids so that one, people think orchids are hard. They're not. And two, so people would buy more orchids. The ice thing is the hokiest thing I've ever heard of. And there's probably going to be like a bunch of people who are like, well, I've given ice cubes to my orchids for blah, blah, blah. And that's great. But comparing a plant that's been watered with ice cubes to a plant that's been watered with warm water, there's no contest. You get so many more flowers out of it. You get such better, robust growth. Your media breaks down evenly, which is what you want because media breaks down over time. Everything is just better. And it's closer to the natural environment. Why would you insist on something that is not, you know, there's no ice in Indonesia. There's no ice in the Philippines, at least naturally. I don't think maybe in the mountains perhaps, but not in the lowlands where a lot of these plants come from. So no ice, please no ice. Love it. Please. You heard it here, (laughs) friends. No ice. Use warm water like the tropical rains that our plants are used to. Yes. Okay. Here's a great one from Daniel Salgado, one of our Patreon plant friends. Tap water versus distilled water versus rainwater. Does it Mm -hmm. really make a difference on what we're watering our houseplants with? If it's something like a carnivorous plant, 
it will need either rain or distill because it's salt sensitive. Mm -hmm. Those are special cases. Certain plants which are not common in the house plant trade at all, like only if you like actively look for these plants, they'll need distilled water and then the seller will tell you that they need distilled water. So you don't have to worry about really too much rain or distilled. If your water comes from a place, like if you have well water and your water has like high calcium salt or high bank, or it's just salty water, it's what we call hard water, mm-hmm. then you might want to like be a little more careful with your water. You might want to, if you're really into your plants, maybe you want to get a reverse osmosis or some kind of thing that takes the salts out, whatever that may be. There's many different ways to do that. What about leaving the water overnight? Some people say that that, if you leave the water overnight, That doesn't get rid of the salts. That only gets rid of the chlorine, which I've, I mean, I live in New York City, like we have chlorinated water and none of my plants have ever suffered from chlorinated water. I mean, probably in some districts, they overchlorinate their water, in which case, yeah, if you can smell the chlorine, it's probably bad, but you can't really smell the chlorine in our water here. So I just water straight out the tap. But if you do come from an area where your water isn't the greatest water coming out of the tap, collect some rainwater, use that. What about using a Brita? I mean, I guess you could. Most plants don't care about the salt. So Brita, if it's like good enough for us to drink, it's probably good enough for your plants to drink. So Mm -hmm. I would say if you have really hard water and Brita gets rid of that hardness of the water, then I'd say go for it. It's an expensive way to do that. I'm sure there is a more economical way that someone will probably comment at some point, whether that's like a distillation machine that you can buy or a reverse osmosis machine that you could buy. You know, if you have a lot of plants, then something like that makes sense. But if you don't have a lot of plants, maybe a Brita filter is the way to go. But keep that Brita filter out of the refrigerator so that you know it's for the plants. Very interesting. One thing to note. So I think you've mentioned this to me before. It's just good for some people to know that if we have harder water, Sometimes like the white that shows up on our leaves or on our terracotta pots, right. that's actually like the calcium in the water. Like yeah. that's minerals yeah, those are calcium from the water. Salts. Yep. And you can just wipe them off the leaves, right? Lemon juice. Lemon juice takes Lemon them juice. right off. If you wipe them down with just water, you're just, they don't really dissolve in water very well. That's why they settle out. That's why they condense on things. Like that's why you get calcium in your bathroom. And you use CLR, but really all you need is just some lemon juice and the acid reacts with the car- with the calcium and redissolves it, forces it to redissolve. Lisa just talked about that on our Fern episode as well. You guys are like two peas in a pot. I love that. Oh yeah. So then one last question and then we'll be done. D wants to know, does it matter whether you water morning or night? And when repotting, is it better to repot with dry or wet soil? If you're gardening outdoors, it does matter whether you water morning, noon, or night. If you're indoors, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, cool. And then what was the second question? When you're repotting, should you water your plant before you repot or should you repot dry? You could do either. The most important part is regardless of whether you use wet or dry soil, you always water immediately after you repot. Right. Because you want the roots and the soil to settle and establish. Exactly. You want that homogenousness, if that's a word. (laughs) I love it. Oh my God, Chris, what an amazing conversation. I'm calling it. I have a feeling this is going to be the most downloaded episode of Bloom and Grow Radio ever. I'm calling it now. I hope so. And if anyone has any further questions, like feel free to contact you, feel free to contact me. I am Botanic Tonic on Instagram. Yes. Botanic Tonic on Instagram. You just hit 10K, right? I'm at 11 point something. 11, baby. So everybody go find Chris on Instagram. Go give him a follow. Share this episode because plant friends, man, what a fun conversation. So share this episode with all your plant friends and let's get this the most downloaded episode of Bloom and Grow Radio ever. Yes. And feel free to ask any question you want. I'm happy to help any way I can. I know. You are so good on your Instagram about replying to everybody's questions. You're much better than I am. So (laughs) definitely go ask Chris watering questions. Or I feel like a lot of times I refer people to you because I'm like, Chris is going to have a better answer than I am. Well, thank you for another amazing conversation, Chris. I cherish our plant friendship and your brain. And I know our audience does too. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be back. All right, plant friends, there it is. Like I said before, I feel like this is going to be the most downloaded episode we see yet. It's just so full of such helpful information. And it's interesting. I feel like everybody struggles with watering. You know, we all struggle with finding our way. And I'm still 
tweaking and changing how I'm watering my plants. So I'm so thankful to Chris. Make sure you follow him at Botanic Tonic for all of his planty musings. This whole conversation made me think about the quote from Zoolander. Water is the essence of wetness, and wetness is the essence of beauty. (laughs) So enjoy that. Think about, remember that funny scene from that great movie? So funny. Thank you again to our Patreon supporters. I love you guys. If anyone is interested in supporting the show on Patreon, you can click the link in the show notes. And thank you to our marvelous episode sponsors that keep the show up and running, Espoma Organics. For indoor or outdoor solutions for your potting mixes, your fertilizing needs, your pest control needs, Espoma Organics has the organic and eco-friendly option for you. They're an awesome family-run company that I adore. You can check out their line of products at espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront. Also, thank you very much to Soltech Solutions for 20% off of your very own Soltech Solution Aspect or Highland Light. Use the code 20BLOOM at checkout for 20% off at soltechsolutions.com. Plant friends, I want to know how you're watering your plants on Instagram, so make sure you tag me and also share this episode if you felt like it was helpful and you feel like the plant community could all give it a listen and learn a thing or two. I hope you're spending fabulous time with your plants, disconnecting from your screens, reconnecting to your plants, reconnecting to yourself. I know I am. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friends, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you are subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're making sure you're subscribed, why don't you head on over to the review section of whatever podcast player you're tuning into and leave us a review. I would greatly appreciate it. If you are interested in more fun and educational planty content, well, plant friend, I've got a whole lot for you. Subscribe to the Bloom and Grow YouTube show, which is my YouTube channel where I bring you along for my personal plant journey, as well as share informational content that pairs with our podcast episodes. Follow me at Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram for behind the scenes, sneak peeks at upcoming episodes, my daily planty lessons and thoughts, and most importantly, tune into my Instagram stories where I am constantly talking with you listeners and plant friends and polling you for content ideas and I'm always interested in seeing what you're loving these days on Instagram. Join the Bloom and Grow mailing list and get a free download of the Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print that she created exclusively for our community. And if you can, support Bloom and Grow Radio by becoming a plant friend on Patreon. For as little as $4 a month, you not only help me bring these planty and informative episodes to thousands of ears around the world, but you will also get the super secret planty password to our exclusive Bloom and Grow Radio Garden Club Facebook group, which is a wonderfully active group of plant friends of the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast who make up what I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. It is a lot of fun over there. And as always, my sweet plant friends, I am here for you. If you have ideas for episode topics, guests, or if you're possibly a business interested in sponsoring the show, reach out to me because I am here to help all of you keep blooming and keep growing. 